Hey everybody, welcome to the Conscious Love Show. Whether you are single, you are in a relationship, or you're healing a broken heart, this show is here to inspire you, to remind you how beautiful, lovable, and amazing you truly are, and to give you the practical tools and insights to navigate from wherever you are right now to the loving relationship that you so deeply want to have. My name is Shane Kohler. I'm a certified transformational coach and trainer with over a decade experience helping people release their trauma and open their hearts to love. I've delivered seminars all over the world, coached thousands of people through my online platforms and programs, and every week I'm coming straight to you with the hottest insights and the best teachers around, bringing you powerful resources and profound conversations to heal your relationship with love, dating, and yourself. I'm so grateful you're here, and if it's your first time, welcome. You can count on me to always show up for you with my very best and a commitment to learn and grow myself so I can serve you to my maximum ability. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. I've got some awesome things planned for you today. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Conscious Love Show. Shane Kohler here. As always, it is a pleasure to be with you today. And today is actually a little bit different than normal. So um, as most of you are probably aware, if you listen to the show regularly, that um, I usually, unless I have a guest or I'm doing something out of the ordinary, but 90% of the time, I actually live stream the podcast on Instagram. And so as I'm speaking, I am usually speaking to a live audience and, um, you know, there's certain energy in that certain energy in talking and, and having someone you're actually speaking to. Well, this morning there were uh, global outages on Instagram and Facebook. And so I wasn't able to stream live the way I normally do. And I decided to take it as an opportunity to uh, try something new. And I'm going to sit here and just record talking to the microphone and talking to all of you listeners out there and um, see what comes through if it's different. So if it sounds a little different today or it feels a little different today, um, that's why, because it is a little different today. But um, I'm excited about it. And ironically, I was I was laughing with my assistant this morning because we've been uh, doing a lot behind the scenes. And I want to do some really cool things with the podcast this year. I want to do some new things. And um, something that I was actually going to announce on Instagram for the first time today is that the podcast is actually going to be leaving Instagram. So we're going to be moving to a private platform where we can host live sessions and and uh, like just do lots of cool stuff with you that I'm, I'm really looking forward to. So um, anyway, I was going to announce today on Instagram that the podcast is going to be leaving and I was going to invite everybody to download the app and, um, you know, just get moving over to our new platform so that we'll be ready to connect. And um, oddly enough, the universe is like, oh, just get off Instagram, you know, no need to announce it. So it's, it's kind of funny it happened that way. Um but anyway, I, I think I will be going back on Instagram at least a few more times because I do want to announce and I do want to let everyone know, but I always say you just, you can't make this stuff up, you know, when you're planning something and then things happen, it's just, it's funny how it works out. But anyway, um, I, I say all that to say that I do want to let you know that, um, the podcast is going to be moving now. It's still going to be available on all major platforms. So wherever you're listening to this message, um, you'll still be able to find it there, but, uh, we are going to be moving on to the Podbean platform where we'll be able to do live stream shows, where we'll be able to have guests from the audience come on the show with us. We'll be able to host special events for special guests. I want to start working on bringing a lot of really awesome guests on the podcast. So um, we're going to do a lot this year. We're going to build a community around it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I definitely want to make sure that you get to be a part of that. So um, best thing for you to do right now is to download the Podbean app. That's P O. D B E A N Podbean. Um, download the Podbean app. You can find it in all the app stores. And uh, if you just download the app and then find the Conscious Love Show on the app and uh, follow the show, that way you'll just be in already. You'll get updates about everything we're doing. And then when we start to host these special events and opportunities to connect and, and different things we're going to be doing, um, you will already be ready to uh, to to get all of that. So make sure you definitely download the Podbean app and follow the Conscious Love Show on the app. And that way, as we start to roll new things out this year, you're going to be right there ready to get all of it. Um, so all that being said, uh, doing things a little different today. And um, the topic that I want to dive into today is why your instincts are misleading you in love. 
why your instincts are misleading you in love. And um, where this is kind of coming from is if anybody who was with me last week or listening to last week's episode, we were talking about pacing a relationship to build attraction and to build connection and to build depth, right? And to rather than just diving in head first to kind of pace a relationship out. And as I've been looking at some of the feedback from that episode, and a lot of people were saying like, oh, I really like this. This makes sense. This is good. This is helpful. But some of the other feedback was that people were saying, I just, I I get it. It makes sense, but I'm struggling with how we're supposed to love someone with a prescription or with a strategy rather than just loving them all out. And I've spent some time this week thinking about that. Like, you know, or or what some people said is like, we can't just love people in the most natural way, right? We've got to have a process or a prescription or a strategy and like, what's wrong with just loving in the most natural way and just doing what comes naturally. And I thought a lot about that this week because it's a great question. It's a valid question. And I think a lot of us have been taught and have believed throughout our lives that at some point we would just meet the right person and there would be some electricity. There would be some, you know, some kind of magnetism between us and that person and we would connect and we could, would hit it off and things would go really well. And, you know, some of us may believe in a soulmate or even if we don't believe in a soulmate, we may just think that it's going to happen like that. Right. And, but this idea that like our soulmate is out there or the right person for us is out there and we just need to wait until we meet the right person and then boom, it's going to happen. It's going to be easy. It's going to be effortless. And that's just not the way it works, right? It's just, it's like, it's never, ever been the way it works. It doesn't work that way for anybody. You know, it's, it's so, it's such a mind fuck when you really start to wake up and you really start to realize that so many of the assumptions that we had about love from growing up, from what we saw in the movies, what we heard in the music, right? Like all the, even things we heard our parents talk about, like, like all of the assumptions we had growing up don't really translate into real life, right? Like, it's like you have these assumptions about the way it's going to be and the movies and music and things have said things, but then you get in the real world, you get dating, you get interacting with people and you realize that it doesn't work that way. Right. It doesn't work that way that things just you just link up. There's just a magnetism and then poof. Like, no, it it doesn't work that way. Right. In fact, there are a lot of potential roadblocks. There are some, you know, speed bumps and and hiccups that you're going to run into. And it is important to have some awareness about how you want to navigate dating, how you want to navigate relationships in a way that actually leads to the desired result. Um. The movement around conscious dating or conscious relationships is, I think, the word or the language that we've given to this. And so, um, like, I don't remember ever hearing this really, like, before 2000, right? Like, I mean, back in the 90s, like, did you ever hear anybody talk about conscious relationships or conscious parenting? I mean, I know know the work has been around and, like, people like the Gottmans have been doing it for a long time. So, like, the work has been around, but this movement of, like, conscious dating, conscious relationship, conscious parenting, like, a more aware and present approach to the experiences we're having is a relatively new thing. And I think back to when I was young and when I was a kid, like, I think about the things I would hear my mom say, or the things I would hear people say, like, you know, do you believe in love at first sight? Or, you know, like I mentioned earlier about soulmates or finding the one, or, you know, when you meet them, you'll just know. And it's like, how many times have I just known? And it didn't fucking mean anything, right? Like, like how many times did I just know they're the one for me, but they weren't. And it was horrible. And the longer I believed they were the one for me, the more it hurt me. Right. So like a lot of these assumptions as we have started to grow into a more aware perception of all of this, and we've started to work with, like I said earlier, conscious dating, conscious relationships, which I just want to define that for a moment. Like when we talk about conscious dating or conscious relationship or conscious parenting or any of this, like what does that really mean? And to be conscious is to be present. It's to be aware. It's to be in touch with everything that you're feeling, everything that you're thinking, it's to be like, have all of this be very present and very alive for you and to be moving through it in a very powerful and present way rather than being driven by these unconscious forces. 
And so what I think distinguishes conscious dating and conscious relationships from unconscious dating and unconscious relationships is when we take a conscious approach, we are in touch with everything that we're feeling, in touch with everything that we're thinking. We are present to all of it, but we are not allowing that to make the decisions, right? We are making decisions from a clear place. We are making decisions from an intentional place. We are making decisions that are highly likely to lead us to the place that we ultimately want to end up. When we are unconscious, we are basically being blindly led by our feelings, right? We're, we're basically, it's like, I feel something and that feeling moves me to act and I act and then I feel something else. And that feeling moves me to act and I act and our feelings are determining our actions. We're not present to whether or not this is the healthiest possible action. We're not present to whether or not this is going to actually lead to the kind of relationship I want with this person. A lot of times we're not even present to whether or not we really like the person, right? Our trauma is activated. We feel this intense need for this person's approval, for their love, for their commitment, for their desire. And we start bending over backwards, doing everything we can to get this person to like us. And we're not even aware if we actually like the person, But our trauma is informing us of this need to get their approval, right? And so when we are unconscious, all of this is just kind of happening. It's like if you imagine yourself being caught in a, in a like vicious current and the current is just carrying you along, right? It's like, imagine being caught in the current of your chaotic thoughts and your chaotic uh, emotions and your trauma from the past and the, the painful experiences you've been through in your life. And imagine yourself just caught in the current of all of this and it's just carrying you, right? You don't get to say where it goes. You don't get to say what stops you make along the way. You don't get to say what happens to you. You don't have any say in how you feel or how you respond to situations. The current is just carrying you and you are just in it, right? Or consciously, if we were to use the same analogy, when you become conscious, it's like you make your way over to the riverbank. You climb your way out, right? You're walking alongside the river. You're observing what's happening in the river. You're watching the movements. You're watching the current, right? You're, you're observing all of this and all of what's happening and you're present to it. You're not afraid of it. You're not hiding from it, right? But you're also not caught up in it. It hasn't overpowered you, right? That is, that is what the conscious path looks like. And there are a lot of people out there that will tell you, just do what you feel, right? Just do what you feel. Just if you feel it, do it. If it feels good, just do it. And like, I just think that's really bad advice, right? It's just really bad advice. Like you can't, you can't say that if it feels good, do it is good life advice because how many possible situations might you end up in, in your life when just feeling good or or doing what feels good is not the right thing to do, right? Like I, I heard Matthew Hussey say this once. He's like, you know, it might feel good to go punch that person in the face. That doesn't mean you should do it, right? Like just do what feels good is not good life advice. Yes, there are times to do what feels good. I'm not saying that we should never do what feels good. There are times to do what feels good, but using that as life advice across the board is really, really bad advice, right? It's just really, really bad advice. So There needs to be an awareness and a conscious present relationship with what we're feeling while also having the grounded ability to make clear decisions, decisions that are in alignment with our values, decisions that are in alignment with our worthiness, decisions that are in alignment with the kind of relationship we want, the direction we want the relationship to go. Right. And so think about it like this. It's like from the moment you meet someone and you might be on a first, second, third date, you're getting to know them in every interaction with that person. There are several things to consider. And every interaction is going to determine where you end up, 
where the relationship ultimately ends up, what happens between the two of you, right? It's like every interaction, every choice you make or don't make, every action you take or don't take is going to in some way determine how that relationship unfolds between the two of you and where the relationship ultimately goes long term. And so if you just let your feelings and your chaotic thoughts make all of those decisions for you, it is probably a guarantee, if not a guarantee, it is highly, highly likely that you will just completely destroy all the potential that relationship had. Because let's talk about where these feelings come from. Let's talk about where these thoughts come from. Let's talk about what's generating them and why it's not necessarily a good advice to just act on them all the time. Right. So when we develop a strong attraction for someone or a strong interest or a strong desire to be involved or have a relationship with someone, you know, most of that has very little to do with who that person is or where they come from or what their values are or like, like, right. Most of, most of what we feel for someone in the early stages of getting to know them have very little to do with who that person is, the values that they hold, the, the character qualities that they embody, right? It is, it is generally in some way me taking impressions from my past. So the people I've been attracted to in the past, the, the physical attraction, the looks that I like, right? The certain attitude that I've either seen people have or seen in movies or read about in books. But it's like, again, it's from my past. It's an impression that, ooh, that's sexy. That's hot. I like that. That, that works for me. That turns me on, right? So there's this, there's this impression based on my past that this person resembles in some way. Right? Like when I look at this person, when I experience this person, when I see them, when I talk to them, when I converse with them, when I feel their energy, when I see the way they talk to me, the way they text with me, when I see how interested they are or their lack of interest or anything and everything and, and all of the above, right? When I experience this about someone, it's going to lock in to certain impressions from my past and the degree to which the way this person is locks into certain impressions from my past is going to determine whether or not I'm attracted to them. Right. And this, I mean, this isn't rocket science, what I'm explaining right now. Like it's, it's pretty simple. It's like, if it's like a matching game, right? If they match up to the impressions from my past that I've said were attractive, I'm going to be attracted to them. If they don't match up to the impressions from my past that I've said were attractive, I'm not going to be attracted to them, right? It's, it's pretty surfacey. It's, it's pretty superficial. It's pretty basic. It's pretty simple, right? There's not, it's not that complex, but you don't just want to keep chasing down impressions from your past. Like you, that, that's actually, that's, that's a bad thing to do long-term, right? I mean, we're all going to do that at times in ways to some degree, we're all going to chase down impressions from our past at certain points in our lives. And I'm not saying to never, ever do that, but as you grow, as you evolve, as you become more conscious, more empowered, more aware, what's going to happen is you're going to want to stop chasing down impressions from your past so often, and you're going to want to start rewriting your past, so to speak, like rewriting those impressions. So if you're not just chasing down impressions from your past, right, then, then what are you doing? Well, you're becoming aware of that first of all, right? And I always say this, I, I say this so often, but like awareness is the first step to everything. Like most of what I talk about on this show, most of what I talk about in the Inspired Love program or what I work with my clients on, like most of what we're doing is we're taking things that are operating in the unconscious or the subconscious, things that are kind of operating in the background, things that are there, but you're not really aware of them, right? They're informing all of your decisions. They're informing your thoughts. They're informing your feelings. They're informing your experiences, but you're not really aware of them, right? They're happening in the background. 
And so the first thing we've got to do is take what's happening in the background and bring it into the foreground. So if we take what's happening in the background and we bring it into the foreground, you might develop a really strong attraction for this person, right? And maybe, you know, who knows how you met him, doesn't matter. But you started dating someone, you met him on an app, you met him through a friend, you met him at a party, whatever. And you're you're feeling like I'm really into this person. I really like them. I really want to see them again. You're starting to wonder, are they thinking about me? When am I going to hear from them again? Do they want to see me as much as I see them? Are they gaining interest? Are they losing interest? Did I say the right thing or the wrong thing in that last text message? Whatever, right? So you're going through all these thoughts. You're having these feelings. There's this desire, this kind of craving or this need to connect with this person, to see them again, to deepen the relationship with them. Now, what you want to do while you're experiencing this is you want to be present to all of it, like really feel all of the associated feelings, like consciously note all of the associated thoughts. Like you, you actually like, I mean, I would journal as you're going through this, like just journal out your thoughts, right? Like, oh, I'm wondering when I'll see them again. I'm wondering if they're thinking about me. I'm wondering if they want to see me as much as I want to see them. I'm afraid I'm going to lose them. I'm, I'm afraid like they're never going to call again. I'm afraid they're losing interest, right? You just like journal and name these thoughts because it's not even that you have to do anything with it, but it's really about clarifying what is happening, right? Before you can, before you can get to like how to fix it, how to correct it, how to do it better. Like you've got to be aware of what is first, right? You've got to be aware of what is happening first. So first become aware of what is happening. What are the feelings in your body? Oh, I feel a tightness in my chest. Oh, I feel nauseous in my stomach. Oh, I feel like tension or tightness in my back. Oh, I I have a headache. Oh, I, I feel like brain fog, like I can't really think. Oh, I feel a tightness in my throat. I mean, just like anything, like name the physical body sensations and name the thoughts, like start to become conscious, going back to that word, right? This is the conscious love show. We're talking about conscious relationships, conscious dating, right? So start to become conscious, start to become present, start to become aware of how this relationship is actually affecting you in very real ways. This interaction with this person is generating very specific thoughts, right? Like you've got to realize these are thoughts that were not there before you started interacting with the person. I mean, they might've been there with someone else before the person, right? But they are thoughts that are being generated by this relationship. These are feelings and sensations in the body that are being generated by this relationship. You don't want to ignore that. You don't want to go to sleep to that. You don't just want to push that into the background and let that drive all your decisions, right? You want to bring it from the background to the foreground. You want to see it, feel it, call it out, name it, experience it. In doing this, you become in control of your experience rather than being controlled by your experience. Now, as you do this, your experience is going to start to change. Like this is really the magic of it. And I I see, like, I see it happen in the inspired love program. I see it happen regularly. Like, like this happens regularly with clients. I see it happen often with lots and lots of people, right? It's, it's because it doesn't take a long time for this transform, uh, excuse me, for this transformation to occur. Once you've learned how to really get present to and feel all of these sensations, your experience will change and it will change quickly because, well, let me, let me just say this first. What's going to happen when you really get conscious, present, and aware to all of the thoughts and all of the feelings that are coming up for you in, in response to this relationship? As you feel into that, there's going to be a decrease in the level of craving that you're experiencing for this person, in the level of need that you experience for this person, in the level of fear 
that you have around like what's going to happen, where's it going to go, is it going to work, is it not, right? In the level of like pressure or tension you experience around the relationship, right? Like the moment you get present to all of these thoughts and feelings, you will almost instantly experience a decrease in their intensity. Now, I say almost instantly, if it's your first time ever doing this, you may need to practice with this for a little while before you experience a decrease. Okay. So I say almost instantly, and that's uh, honestly like, that's how it happens for me these days. But if you've never done this before, then it may require some practice. It probably will also require working with a coach or a therapist because like you, you may need some guidance in learning how to do this. But once you practice this, once you get good at it, once you learn how to kind of take control of your emotional and mental experience of the situation, you will experience a decrease in the tension and in the pressure and in the fear and and all the negative associated emotion. Something else I want to say, because I've been talking about it kind of from an anxious experience, right? Like if you're, oh, do they like me? When am I going to see them again? Are they losing interest? How do I keep them? That's more of an anxious experience. I do just also want to say that the same thing works for more of an avoidant experience. So an avoidant person might be feeling, this is a lot of pressure. I feel suffocated. Like I feel like I need space. I feel like I can't show up for them. I feel like they want too much. I feel like I'm not ready for this, right? Like that might be more of an avoidant experience. It's, it's a different side of the same coin, right? All of it, all of it are ways to avoid intimacy, whether we do it by being too needy and pushy or whether we do it by pulling away and like withdrawing, both are, are actually attempts to avoid intimacy, right? Both are ways of pushing love out of our life. And so whether you're experiencing this on the anxious side of the spectrum or on the avoidant side of the spectrum, it doesn't really matter. The practice is the same, right? Really get present to the thoughts and the associated feelings. And the more you allow yourself to really feel all of that and be present to all of that, you will experience a decrease in the intensity of it. Now, this decrease in intensity is, it's the most important part of this whole thing because that's the moment that you have power. You see, like, the moment the, as the intensity comes down, your power comes forward, right? As the intensity of the experience lessens, you strengthen. And so this is where you start to have clarity. This is where you start to have a deeper understanding of the situation. This is where you start to not operate so much from the traumatic need that's being triggered, right? Whether it's the abandonment wound or the fear of rejection or the need to prove yourself or the need for validation or the need to get this person to like you, right? But like rather than being driven by those kinds of trauma needs, as the experience diminishes and lessens, you now have more clarity around the situation. You've got to understand like this, like you can never have clarity when you're afraid. And, and I think no matter what you're going through, like we're talking about a dating or relationship context, but in any area of your life, if you're dealing with a work challenge, if you're dealing with, you know, a parenting challenge, like whatever, whatever challenge you're confronting right now, if you have a lot of fear around that, it's going to be impossible to find clarity, right? Clarity comes from a lack of fear. And you've got to understand, like, I, I think when it comes to our romantic interactions, Our fear is so heightened and I think it can be so confusing because in our romantic interactions, fear actually masquerades as love, right? You'll be driven by fear, you know, whether you're chasing someone down or over texting or over calling or being too needy, right? Like you feel like you're, you feel like you're in love but you're actually being driven by fear. Like that, that's actually not loving, right? Love could actually be like, I'll give them some space, right? Like I'm, love is secure. Love is confident. Love is not needy. Love is not desperate. So love is like, I'll give them some space. They'll get back to me when they get back to me. They'll get back to me when they have time. And underneath it is like, I know I'm enough anyway. So if they don't get back to me, it's not that big of a deal, right? Like that's, that's how love operates. And you can't really, like fear is the antithesis of love right? Fear is the thing that is always going to take love off of the table. 
the moment that fear starts being the driving motivator in your choices and your actions and your feelings, like the fear, the moment fear starts being the driving motivator is the moment that you can be sure that you are not operating from love because fear is always, always, always going to operate against what love would do. So I want to just, I want to take some like kind of practical examples here and and really help you understand how this works because your instincts most of the time are not serving you when it comes to love and romance, right? Like most of the time they are just not. Most of the time they're acting against you. They are leading you into familiar old patterns that will lead to the same familiar results. And if you're listening to this right now, I mean, most people don't listen to a podcast like this because everything is great in their relationships. Maybe you are that person. And if so, wonderful. But like most people are listening to this because they're struggling in their relationships, right? Whether you're married and you're struggling in your marriage, whether you're dating and you're struggling in your, uh, you know, dating life and looking for love, but whatever it is, like you're probably listening to this right now because you're struggling and you're looking for some guidance. And what, what I just want to point out for all of you is that if you're struggling in your marriage, if you're struggling in someone you're dating, if you're struggling in dating in general, Like if you're struggling right now, the reason you're struggling is because you got some bad advice. I'm going to call it advice. It may not have been exactly advice, but ideas, right? You got some bad guidance, some bad direction, some bad advice, some bad guidance about relationships a long, long time ago. And when I say you got this advice or this guidance, I don't mean somebody sat you down and told this to you. I mean, it got wired into your consciousness by your environment, by the things you saw, by the things you experienced, by the world you lived in. And most of us have never really sat down and thought about how to consciously date or to consciously create a relationship. Most of us just want love. We just want to love. We want to be loved. And so we go and we start trying to love which is a beautiful thing, except if we're doing it on top of all this bad guidance we got, it's only going to lead us to the unfulfilling and hurtful places that we don't want to be. And so if you're listening to this right now and you're in a place in your love life that you're like trying, but you're like getting just the bad results, no matter what you do, right? No matter what you do, you just can't seem to have it work. Like I I want you to realize that you're operating on a bad guidance system. And that's why it's leading you to bad results time and time and time and time and time again. And so what you need to do is, and and I know I've, I've spoken into this already today, but it's really about getting out of that bad guidance system and creating a new one. And so I want to talk about some of the practical steps to that. And so when you're, when you're getting to know someone and you're feeling that drive to get closer to them, um, again, if you're more on the avoidant side of the spectrum, you may be feeling a drive to pull away from them. But it, it again, it doesn't matter which side you're on because the work is the same either way. But you, you want to look at your automatic reactions, right? You want to look at those automatic reactions, those things that the relationship is just bringing up on its own, right? You're, you didn't ask for them, but they're there. The relationship is just activating these reactions. And maybe you just want to see them as often as possible, right? Like maybe you just want to see this person as often as you can. You're like, you're waiting for the call or the text. And you're like, I just can't wait to see them again. I just like, when am I going to hear from them? And uh, like, you're just like overly excited, right? Like think about like for somebody that you barely know, for somebody that you just met, like you really shouldn't be this excited, right? Like you're, if, if you think about that, like we get so excited about a new interaction. I remember like when I was single, like I would be up all night on a dating app and like I would meet someone and we would start some conversation. I would think, oh my God, we just had the best conversation. And I would be so excited about someone that I met on a dating app that I have like no real relationship with. I might never even see them in person, but one good conversation got me so excited, right? And and I would think when it was happening, this is a good thing. Maybe they're the one, maybe it's going to work out. Maybe it's going to go somewhere. But what I was really doing was I was just setting myself up for a major, major crash 
because I didn't know that person. Yeah, we had a good conversation on a dating app. Like they might be out with someone else right now. Like they might be sleeping with someone else right now. Like I know nothing about them. And an appropriate response to that would not be to be very, very excited, but an appropriate response would be, oh, that was a great talk. You know, I wonder if we'll have another one of those. It would be cool to see if something happens there. Right. And just like very, like not that emotional not that reactive, not like, it, it's just a very kind of neutral response that that was a great conversation. I would like to have more conversations like that. Maybe something will become of this, but that's all, right? Like that's all. And just think about the reactions we have and how disproportional they are to what is actually happening. And so if you've started dating someone and you're thinking about them all the time and you want to see them again and you're waiting for that text or that call and you're, you know, running down the rabbit hole of maybe this is the one, maybe we'll get married, maybe we'll live happily ever after, like you want to, you want to start to recognize that you do that and you want to practice stopping that. Like I I really, I, I, I know like you almost may not even want to stop that because it feels like a good thing. It is not a good thing. It's a destructive thing because what happens when you do that is the next thing, you know, you're going to show up to this interaction with this person and you're going to be relating with them. Like you're already married with kids and for them, it's just going to be a second date. And there is a disproportion to that that you cannot hide no matter how hard you try, right? It is going to come through in the things you say and the things you do and the way that you interact with someone. And it's going to come off weird and you're going to sabotage that relationship. And this is why, going back to some of the comments I read, right? Like this is why we need a little bit of a prescription to love someone. We need a little bit of strategy to build a conscious relationship with someone. It's not good advice to just love them in the most natural way possible. Because the most natural thing for us is usually something very unnatural. That's the thing. What is usually the most natural thing for us is something that in reality is unnatural and it's, it's because of our trauma, right? Like I, I do this work and, and I, 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 I've said this many times, but like I, I do this work and I see the transformation that happens in people and I see what natural responses look like once the trauma is no longer informing people's reactions. And I have seen women, I mean, I have seen and I do see women who have lived with extreme anxious attachment for their entire lives. And within a couple months of working together, they all of a sudden feel a peace and a calmness and a clarity and a confidence around love, romance, dating, like their fear of rejection just kind of dissipates They're going down the rabbit hole and like, you know, playing the tape out way too far. Like that stops their need for people's attention just disappears. And like, and the reason this happens, like I want to, I really want you to understand this. The reason this happens, the only reason this happens is because their responses are no longer being informed by their traumatic past right? Their responses are now being informed by an intuitive sense, uh, a clarity about like who they are, what they really want, what they're worth. Like, you know, when your trauma is informing you, if you, if you feel, if you feel a sense of deprivation or unworthiness, or you're dealing with a history of abandonment, And like, like there's a, there's a something inside of you. And and if this is you, you know it, right? There's a, there's a sense or a feeling inside of you that like, I just can't expect a lot from life. I don't know that like anybody's ever really going to love me. 
I, I don't feel that like I'm enough. I don't feel that I'm really that like wanted or desirable. I don't feel like there's anything about me that's that amazing, right? Like if you're, if you're living with that, then you've got to understand how that translates to relationship. And I'm going to say, if you're, if you're more anxiously oriented, it translates to desperately wanting someone to be with you. And it doesn't really matter who that person is. I mean, yeah, you may have some basic standards, you know, you may have certain standards of attraction, right? They need to look a certain way. Like you're, you're not just going to go date somebody that you're not attracted to at all, but, but the standards are relatively minimal, right? Like it doesn't have to be who that person is as a human. It doesn't have to be the quality of their character. It doesn't have to be how they show up to every area of their lives, how trustworthy they are, right? Like we will, we will often partner with a very toxic person just to meet that need of having someone there. And if that's you, you know, that's you because you've done this before, right? So if that's you, like, you know, it's you. And the reason you do that is because there's this emptiness inside, right? And, and if you're more anxious, you want to just latch onto someone and just have that security of having someone by your side. And if you're more avoidant, you just push relationships away and you push them 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 away because you have learned that when you let someone in and someone sees who you are, that they don't like what they see and they leave you. Right. And so you've, you've learned in your life that it's better to just not let someone get too close than it is to really let them see me because it's better when they leave and they didn't know who I was than when they found out who I was and then they left. Right. And I know with the words I just said, I've, I've touched everybody in some way. Right. Like we're, we're hitting all the marks there. And then there are the people who kind of vacillate back and forth right? We vacillate between desperately attaching to people and avoiding people, right? And many of my clients are this way where it's like, you know, for different reasons, different kinds of stimulus, different kinds of relationships hit you in different ways, but whatever the reason you vacillate back and forth, right? I'm super anxious one day. I'm super avoidant the next. But what I, what I'm getting at here is it doesn't really matter how the dysfunction is manifesting because what we're talking about here is that feeling inside that feeling of emptiness, that feeling of not being enough, that feeling of, I don't really think I'm lovable. I don't really think anyone would want me. I don't really think I'm that valuable. I think that when people really find out who I am, they're not going to want anything to do with me. They're going to leave me, right? Like that is the feeling I'm talking about. And it can show up in lots of different ways, but that is the feeling and that feeling when it drives your relationships is always, always, always going to lead you down a path to destruction. And what I see in my clients is as we work with this and as, as the traumas are healed. And and when I talk about trauma healing, that's really what I'm saying is it's not that the trauma disappears. It's not that you never feel insecure ever again. It's not that you don't struggle with these things still. It's, I mean, these things are a part of us. They live with us. I don't know that we ever really get rid of them, but when the trauma heals, what happens is the trauma is no longer informing my decisions. The trauma is no longer making my decisions for me. And then what happens is we have a very natural response to relationships, right? We have a very natural response to relationships because the trauma isn't intervening. And so when we're just getting to know someone, we can actually literally be just getting to know them. I mean, like how profound is that? Like think about just getting to know someone and being totally okay. Just getting to know them. Hey, if this goes somewhere, that would be wonderful. 
If it doesn't, that's beautiful too. Like, like, I mean, I want you to imagine right now, and I know like this is going to be mind blowing for some of you. If you really let in what I'm about to say, imagine you're dating someone. Imagine you've been dating someone for three months and you like them and you're excited about it. And you see some possibility for where it can go, but you're not over attached. You're calm, you're grounded, your feet are on the ground, you're at ease. It's all good, right? There's no, there's no stress. There's no anxiety. It's all good. And then imagine after three months of getting to know this person and thinking it might go somewhere and all of this, that they come to you and they say that they've been dating multiple people and that they've made a decision that they've met someone they've really connected with and that they've chosen to stop seeing multiple people and to be exclusive with this person. And this person is not you. And now imagine in that moment that you might feel a small degree of disappointment. You might feel a small degree of like, Oh, well, that's a bummer. I I, I thought something might happen here. But the larger experience, like the dominant experience is actually that you are happy. You are happy for that person because you actually care about them. You're not just in it to get what you want. You actually genuinely care about that person and you want them to be happy. And so even though you're mildly disappointed, More than that, you are happy that somebody you care about found what they want. And then in addition to that, you recognize that two people finding each other right in front of your face is actually the universe speaking to you and saying, hey, it's possible Look, it just happened right in front of your face. I mean, think about that. And then instead of feeling let down, you feel inspired. You feel enlivened. And this whole experience actually fills you with energy and gives you more hope than you've ever had around love before. I mean, think about that. What would it be like to experience love that way? And l- let me add one more piece to this. Maybe the most, maybe the most, what's the word? The most euphoric part of this whole experience or the most beautiful and touching part of this whole experience is that more than being happy for him or her, or the person that they met, or the love that they're creating, or even the proof that it's happening right in front of your eyes and it can happen for you too, the best part about it is, is the gratitude that you feel for being able to experience this situation in this way. And that in and of itself is like proof in your soul that I am on the path of love because I am able to experience even my disappointments in a loving way. I am even able to experience my disappointments through love. Even my disappointments inspire me. And then you become unstoppable. And, and I want to say, like, I am not talking about a fantasy right now. I am talking about a very, very real experience that happened for me while I was a single person. And it happened for my wife while she was a single person. This is how we were dating when we met each other. This is something that has happened for so many of my clients that I can't even count to date. And it just keeps happening over and over and over again. And, and I want, like, when I see this change happen for a client, 
Like I am happier about this than I'm even happier when they find a relationship. And the reason is, is because I know once this change happens, it's a done deal, right? I'm like, our work is done. All you need to do now is just go live your life and have a good time. It'll happen when the time is right. But once you get to the place where you can live free of your trauma, everything changes. It's a new reality. It's a new world. It's it's a completely new experience. And so going back to the topic for today, why your instincts are misleading you in love. Why can't we just love in the most natural way possible? As I said earlier, for most of us, the most natural thing is something very unnatural because it's informed by our trauma. You see, I I said that when my wife and I were dating, this is how we were dating that ultimately led us to each other. And what I didn't share today, I've shared this a lot of times, what I didn't share today is the work that each of us did in our own respective lives to get to the place where we could date this way. All the relationships for both of us that did not work out, all the relationships that we sabotaged and so on that did not work out while we were learning this, all the disappointments we had to go through and actually reflect and say, why did that situation go that way? What was I doing? How was I showing up? How am I continually showing up to these situations that is causing them to turn out this way? And by looking into that and exploring that and clarifying that and saying, okay, like, I mean, I remember times when I would be dating someone And I would like be full on like ruminating about them and wondering when am I going to hear from them and should I text them? And I texted them yesterday and I haven't heard anything and why haven't they gotten back to me and are they seeing someone else and you know, all of it, right? I remember all of that and I remember moments when I would literally have to like put my phone down and say to myself like Shane. Like, you got to stop this. Like, you got to stop this. And I would have to sit with that experience. Like, sometimes I would feel like I would literally have to restrain myself to prevent myself from sending a text, right? I would literally just have to, nope, I am not going to do it. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to sit with this experience. I'm going to go take my dog for a walk. I'm going to work on my business. I'm going to go have fun with a friend. But like, whatever I do, I am not going to text that person. Because I am not going to let my trauma make my decisions for me. And as I practiced that, I developed the ability to regulate my nervous system. I developed the ability to bring the intensity of those experiences from a 10 to a 2. I developed the ability to find clarity in these situations, to ask myself, what do I really want to come from this situation? And what's the best possible way for me to show up to this situation to lead to that outcome? I developed the ability to look within myself and say, okay, I really, 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 really want to be with this person right now. But let me be honest about something. I don't even really know them. And so my intense desire to be with this person must not be about anything real. Right? Like we, we've got to start to ask ourselves those difficult questions. We've got to start to challenge our basic assumptions about love, about relationship. 
We've got to start to get present to the things that we feel and the thoughts that we think and ask ourselves, where is this coming from? Is it coming from wounding? Is it coming from fear? Or is it coming from clarity and love? Right? Like we have got to start being present enough, being conscious enough to know the difference between our past wanting to continue to play itself out and our creativity bringing a new future into being. I'm going to say one more thing here, and I think I'll close out with this today. And this is just a a fundamental life principle that, that applies everywhere all the time. Your past is alive inside of you. Every experience you've ever had, every memory, every impression, it is alive inside of you. It did not die. It is still there. Now, you're not consciously aware of all of it. It exists in a place that we don't have conscious access to all of it. But little pieces of it just bubble up from time to time. When you have a memory, when you have a, you know, like that's just your past bubbling up from time to time. Your past wants to relive itself. Right? So all of the pain that you've experienced in the past, it wants a second chance. It wants a do-over. Like there, there, is, there is a very real force inside of you that wants to relive and recreate all the pain of your past. And simultaneously, there is a force inside of you that wants to let the past go and bring in a future that is completely new, that just completely turns it upside down, that is just unlike anything you've ever experienced. Both of these forces are very real and very alive inside of you. And the strongest one is the one that you invest your energy into. Now, If you're human and you were born on this planet and you haven't done a lot of work on yourself, then you have spent your whole life investing in your past and recreating it. That's just the way it happens when we're on autopilot. That's just what the world teaches us to do when we have no special training. And so your greatest work in this life is to rein in your past and fuel the creative part of yourself with passion and love and energy and dreaming and exploring and playing and trying things out and falling on your face and getting up and trying again and failing and failing and failing and then succeeding and then failing and failing and failing and then succeeding again. And it's your choice. That is the most magnificent thing about this life it is it is your choice. And all of your dreams are waiting for those who are willing to do this so important work to approach life from a healthy and healed place. And when you approach life from that place, your life will reflect that as well. So I'm going to end with that. I want to send everybody so much love today. Um, As always, you know, this is tough stuff, right? I I know, and I, I like to end with this, is that I know we are dealing with literally some of the most challenging things we will ever go through in our life, like relationship and heartbreak and singleness and like navigating life alone or being in like a destructive marriage and trying to save it or trying to get out of it. I mean, these are literally the hardest things we will ever go through in life. And at the end of the, at the end of the day, 
the only person that you can really count on to pull you through these experiences is, is yourself. Like, yes, there, there's a lot of support for those who reach out for it. But at the end of the day, it all falls on you. This is your life to create the way you choose, the way you see in accordance with what you believe is possible. So sending all of you so much love wherever you are, whatever you're going through today, there's a way through, there's a way out, there's a way to make it magnificent. And even if you don't see it right now, I just want you to believe that and just be where you are, just be where your feet are right now and make a commitment to show up today to whatever's in front of you today in the most powerful way you possibly can. And then do the same thing tomorrow and the same thing the day after that and keep doing that day after day after day and everything else will take care of itself. If you want to apply for the Inspired Love Program, I'm going to leave the link below wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you need support, support is available. We have options available for all different budgets. Um, So, you know, money is not an obstacle. You can make the time. If you need the support, it's there. Um, Apply at the link below wherever you're listening to this podcast. I'll see you in the program and I'll see you back here next Tuesday. Lots of love, everybody. Wishing you magnificent love. And I'll see you back here next week. Take care. Bye. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love.